I'm excited and pleased to introduce this evening's keynote speaker, Dr. Stephen Mulkey, president of Unity College. As the president of Unity College, he has championed sustainability science, which he sees as the defining framework for academic programming at Unity and beyond. A wonderful colleague, a superb mentor, please welcome to the stage Dr. Stephen Mulkey. Thank you, Give me a hug. Thank you so much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am uh, honored and privileged to be here and also humbled. Uh, I too am disappointed because I was looking forward to dinner with David Orr tonight, and that's not going to happen, but I hope he does get here later. Um, David is one of my heroes, um, and he has been for 30 years. And so what I'd like to talk to you about is our critical mission uh, in what I think is going to be known generally as the environmental century. This is where push comes to shove, and everybody in this room pretty much knows that. But I'd like to show you a little bit of data first, and then I'd like to talk about what some of the serious impediments are in higher education to engineering the curriculum in the way that it needs to be engineered in order to deliver on the promise. So um, let me begin with a quote from David. All education is environmental education. By what we include or exclude, we teach the young that they are apart from or part of the natural world. Um, it's very powerful. And I think that it's this duality that we have perpetuated since um, really education entered its halcyon years post-World War II is actually one of the things that's killing us right now. Another, another quote that really struck me from this remarkable volume called Bankrupting Nature says, the way we have structured research and organized universities is not consistent with how reality works. The sciences and universities are stuck in the disciplinary status quo that they have been in for centuries. This statistic too is my experience. So what I'd like to offer to you today, if I can humbly call it this, a manifesto for higher education. So let's begin. Um, there is no mincing words on this. Our current emissions trajectory is catastrophic. No matter how you model or project the current trajectory, the two red lines at the top of the graph take you someplace that we do not want to go, that are not consistent with civilization as we currently understand it. The global temperature rise by the end of the century will be in excess of 5 degrees Celsius, according to the UK Hadley Center, or 4.5 degrees Celsius, according to the IPCC fifth assessment report. The concentrations of CO2 are higher now than in 4 million years, and the rate of increase is, almost, is more rapid than it has been in 65 million years. I'm an ecologist. I'm trained as a tropical forest uh, ecologist. I've worked on form and function of tropical trees and plants for 25 years or more, affiliated with the Smithsonian. So one of the things that really f draws out my attention is what I'm calling the overlooked ecological imperative. The climate zones are moving faster than many organisms can adapt or migrate. And this is going to put a premium on our management and our adaptive management plans. And what I'd really like to talk to you a little bit about tonight is what the role of higher education is in bringing those to the fore. It's not just the climate zone shifts, it's also oceans worldwide. This is the Gulf of Maine, where I currently live. And you can see that surface and deep waters are now at 150 year record high and uh, the consequences of this are manifold. Uh, if we look at the distribution of sea surface temperatures around the world, we find something very unusual. Right at the tip of Greenland is this very, very cold spot. And that's being generated by the melting of the ice in Greenland in enormous quantities. And this Gulf Stream apparently is slowing at partly as a consequence of this. This indicates a change on a millennial time scale. In fact, there's unprecedented cooling of the North Atlantic in, in over 1,000 years. So it's obvious, 
humanity is at a crossroads. There's no question about it. Um, and by 2030, we'll need two planets. Um, this can't go on, obviously. Um, over the next 40 years, we'll need to produce as much food as we have in the last 8,000 years in order to feed our population. And the population is projected to continue to expand to between 9.6 and 12.3 billion souls by 2100. This is very sobering. And we know that we, in many quantifiable ways, have exceeded the safe operating space of our planetary boundaries. We've certainly done so in terms of this incredible hemorrhage of biodiversity. There's no question that we are in the great sixth extinction of the planet, and we are the agent that is causing it. Ocean acidification, ozone depletion, the nitrogen cycle, we throw nitrates around with reckless abandon. It has enormous consequences for how living things react. It's literally changing the base of the food chain and changing the foundation of the ecology of this planet. Accordingly, how does that interact with the movement of the climate growing zones? These are complex questions, and I would ask you to think for a moment, are we addressing them in the classroom and in the field and in experiential learning? Are our students leaving the institution ready to engage with these complex questions? So obviously there's an imperative. Failure to implement sustainable practices will result in unequivocally catastrophic consequences that will be mostly irreversible for thousands of years to come. It's urgent that we produce practitioners able to integrate knowledge from multiple disciplines and understand the trade-offs among possible solutions. Simply put, higher education has an ethical, some would say moral, obligation to be the foundation of sustainable civilization. I certainly feel that way. Now, rather than the, the planetary boundaries uh, quantitative uh, graph, I, I like to show this cartoon from Kate Rayworth at Oxfam. What it shows is that we have a social foundation near the center of these concentric circles that includes sustainable water, food, income, resilience, health, gender equity, social equity, energy jobs, and education. Education is absolutely keystone to the operation of finding that safe and equitable space for humanity. Um, so I would submit that sustainability must be the primary mission of higher education. Some would consider that a radical notion. But let me submit to you that the way we've been operating since World War II and the way that money has flowed into higher education from the Sputnik era onward has been driven by this competition to achieve greater and greater technological proficiency. Well, what about greater and greater sustainability proficiency? We've got a different mission now. Let's embrace it. Uh, let's quit living in those halcyon years right after the war, the, the era in which I was trained. And I would submit that this is also the purpose of our economy. We need to start seeing our economy as being engineered to do exactly this. So what are the components of sustainability in higher education? Everybody here knows what they are. This is our European passive style residence hall, the first in the United States. It is a remarkable uh, facility. It, uh, the first winter it was open, um, we were able to heat it for the entire winter for I think $84 in electricity costs. It's, it's an amazing achievement in terms of, of engineering and design. Uh, we know that administration and finance are crucial to sustainability in higher education. Unity College was the first college to divest its endowment from the top 200 fossil fuel companies. Thank you. Now, before I go on, um, I sit on the board of AISHI, which is an honor and a privilege, but I want you to make no mistake. Many of you are sustainability officers. You're directors of your sustainability offices. Um, I have never seen a more uh, um, stressed out group <laughs> in higher education. You guys are expected to do everything with almost nothing. And I want you to know that, that the board and AISHI will always support operational sustainability. Now that said, 
the mission of higher education is not operational sustainability. It's uh, teaching, research, learning. It's, what, it's all that other stuff that you and I support as we move forward. We have to walk the talk. And so operational sustainability is absolutely a given. It's absolutely crucial. But really, it's the academic and co-curricular where the rubber meets the road. And we've really got to get with it because it's not happening. Uh, if we look at where that nexus occurs in the uh, group of uh, academic enterprises at the undergraduate level, we find that it's a, it's a nexus among natural systems, sustainability solutions, and social systems. One of the things that's often missed, left out of our approach to solutions is that social primate part of the equation. And if we look around the country and we ask the question, where are their four-year institutions offering interdisciplinary environmental and sustainability degrees, we can puff ourselves up and feel pretty good. Right? We've got, we got a lot of coverage there. It's looking, looking great. Um, however, let's look a little more closely. In fact, if you look at the average scores in, in STARS, the ACE data suggest a substantial emphasis by member institutions on sustainability in education and research. Well, let's start to dissect the data a little bit. Uh, I've been working with Shirley Vincent at the National Council for Science and the Environment and the Council of Environmental Deans and Directors, and she has uh, taken a very hard-nosed approach. She looks at the baccalaureate colleges, the master's colleges and universities, the research universities, and if you total them up, the vast majority of these programs lack any significant autonomy and equal status with the standard disciplinary silos. And they must fight for those resources among the various competing interests within the university. I have experienced this personally my, myself twice, once at the University of Florida when I found my program defunded during a recession uh, and, in fact, that had enormous consequences for our ability to move forward in the kind of interdisciplinary work we were doing. It also happened again at the University of Idaho, a uh, very similar scenario. We've recently published a paper on this called Interdisciplinary Environmental and Sustainability Education, Islands of Progress in a Sea of Dysfunction. So this is a nationwide problem. It's simply not, we're not provisioning these programs adequately. In fact, I would submit that interdisciplinary environmental units have mostly failed to provide holistic, integrated environmental programming. And if you look at where this is happening, there are over a thousand interdisciplinary environmental programs in the U.S. and Canada. They operate by three core principles, interdisciplinarity, systems thinking, absolutely crucial, understanding the nature-human interaction as complex and dynamic, and, but integration of knowledge across those disciplines has mostly failed because the programs have muddled goals. Is there a clear focus on problem solving? Are there keystone, capstone courses that have the kind of rigor that we need for the students to be exposed to? My answer is no, um, and I've helped design many of those programs. The programs are a curricular smorgasbord. We take our courses from the existing disciplinary silos, we patch them together, and we call it a degree, maybe adding a special course of our own here and there. The question is, is it being done well? Well, some of the places that it's being done well probably are the Nicholas School of the Environment, uh, the U UW College of, of the Environment, an excellent opportunity to look at where it's done well. Arizona State and their sustainability science programming there is, is uh, exemplar. So there are islands of progress within the sea of dysfunction. The silos themselves are the most pernicious and difficult aspect of this in this research fight, in this, this resource fight among the, the participants of a university, of the various units. The silos prevent the development of the integrated discipline because they write the paycheck for the faculty that serve in these programs. And that's the most important uh, linkage that we need to understand. I would submit to you that we're going down that road again. 
we are repeating these mistakes as we attempt to install sustainability in higher education. Folks, we do not want to do this. There's got to be a better way. So uh, my recommendations for, for interdisciplinary environmental and sustainability programs, forgive me, I'm going to be a bit wonky for a moment, and that is IES programs should be autonomous within the university. They should have their own budget. They should have their own faculty in sufficient numbers to ensure the continuity of that program if their affiliate faculty have to withdraw for one reason or another. University budgets and developmental priorities should, be ad should adequately support the programs to ensure continuity. Right now, uh, it's anybody's guess if these programs are going to be alive in five years, depending on what the economy does and what the university chooses to do with its budget. I might add, as a president, it, absolutely it's crucial that there be leadership from the very top to get this done. Interdisciplinary leadership and staff should be sufficiently resourced to support the program development and innovation. And affiliated and jointly appointed faculty should have formalized tenure and promotion criteria. If you spend a third of your academic career serving this interdisciplinary unit, who notices it? Do you get credit for it? Does it appear in your three-year review? And if it doesn't, why not? Does your silo respect that work? So what we've done at Unity College is a little bit different. Uh, we've framed the entire undergraduate liberal arts curriculum under the framework of the U.S. National Academy's uh, consideration known as sustainability science. Sustainability science is exactly what it sounds like. It's education and research that seeks to understand the complexity of interactions among economy, society, and nature in order to propose concrete solutions to complex problems threatening our very survival. And the survival of, of a multitude of other living forms as well. Put simply, it's simply knowledge for mitigation, adaptation, and building resilience. And it's endorsed by the U.S. Academy, the National Science Foundation, and the AAAS. Now one of the things I'd like to encourage you to fully embrace here is that the word science includes our red-haired stepchild, social science, Often social science is not given a full seat at the table. And this is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. If you want to see the problem, look in the mirror. We are social primates and we're the ones that have to address the problem and we have to understand, understand ourselves. So adaptive management, which is shown in this cartoon from the US Global Change Research Program, is really what this is all about. And right at the core is stakeholder engagement, no surprise. We need to be teaching very complex, high-level thinking about what are the possible outcomes. We live in an uncertain time as these climate zones move and the ecological systems respond to them. We are creating ecosystems that have never been seen before. We are create, creating changes in ecosystems that these ecosystems do not have any evolutionary history of. So we need to understand the various scenarios that could occur. A formalized way of understanding this is called scenario analysis. Now I want everybody to write all this down. Um, this is just to show, this is simply the community concept map for how will climate change affect a place called Port Orford. It's uh, all of the various moving parts. Uh, rarely do you have all of those various moving parts at the table when you're trying to understand how to come up with a sustainability plan. This is what we need to be teaching. Concept and systems map mapping. Sustainability science is pre-adapted to do this. If you think about the interdisciplinary approach to understanding a problem, and I've experienced this so often in my life, we get various experts around the table to understand a problem. And uh, well, maybe in a couple of weeks, you've defined the word model. You know, in, in other words, we, each discipline sees 
the problem through their narrow lens of, of their discipline. And in fact, they often define the entire universe in terms of what they know about their discipline. So getting them to communicate and effectively solve the problem can be uh, fairly challenging. That's not to say that it doesn't work, it does. But it shouldn't be that challenging to do this. Sustainability science takes the practitioner or the students and makes them the nexus of the knowledge, makes them the knowledge broker. Think about it for a minute, folks. Uh, we have been teaching, we have been organizing teaching and learning the same way since the Middle Ages. Uh, we have a, a uh, font of knowledge that the students come to to get the information. Well, uh, why? Uh, for the first time in the history of humanity, we all have access to all knowledge, effectively. So we need to learn how to use this incredible opportunity in our teaching and learning systems. And one way to do it is to break down the silos and actually train the student where to go get the information in a problem-solving context. So you give them the tools to essentially dive deeply into each of the disciplines that they need in order to understand a problem. Now, many educators have said to me, oh, uh, you can't do that. It's too, too difficult. Or, oh, the undergraduate mind is not developed enough to do that. The only thing I can say is that is not my experience. This empowers a student. They light up like a Christmas tree and they go for it. It's a great opportunity. So transdisciplinary is a, is a modality in which the various disciplines are integrated through the problem solving process and focused on solutions to real world problems. So foundational skills for sustainability science uh, have been looked at by a lot of people. One of the, ones, one of the uh, frameworks that I love is the one by Arnheim Weick at Arizona State. And he talks about systems competency, anticipatory competency, strategic comp competency, normative competency, all leading to interpersonal competency, how we deal with one another. If you think about it for a moment, there is no equation in here for ozone depletion. There is no equation in here for uh, carbon sequestration. There's nothing technical about this. We're all talking about the people involved. So it's the humanities and the social science that are really foundational to this. Critical thinking, written and verbal communication, media literacy, ethical context, and management. Management, I've found, uh, frequently, as taught in business colleges, is crucial to a student's ability to find a way forward. The liberal arts model provides what has been called the pro-social foundation. Pro-social loosely translated means citizenship. Uh, that is necessary for environmental and sustainability programming. Without it, we don't get where we need to go. Now, I'm fond of quoting Alvin Toffler. I love his statement, the illiterate of the 21st century will be those who cannot read and will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And that's what transdisciplinary sustainability science should be all about. So what should they possess? The liberal arts pro-social foundation, superior literacy, numeracy, um, and normative competency. They need to understand the possible trade-offs among different solutions in a human social context and in a political context. The transdisciplinary sustainability science framework creates problem solvers that are solution focused Information literacy is absolutely crucial. The faculty act as the curators in this system. The faculty provide the context and the framework and the guidance as to where the good information is and how to apply it. Understand natural and human systems as complex and interconnected, which is so often lacking. Uh, I remember teaching a, a introductory biology course for majors at the University of Florida, 660 souls. Is that teaching? I'm not sure. Uh, but one of the things that impressed me about m the population of that class is how little contact they had with nature. It's, I think it's a serious problem nationwide in all of our systems. So here are some of the things we've done at Unity College. We frame student research as transdisciplinary, bringing different students from different areas of interest into the field. Faculty engagement is absolutely crucial for this. If your faculty are not on board, it's not gonna happen. And faculty are largely autonomous, so there needs to be leadership from the top to make that happen. 
experiential as well as didactic learning. Experiential is important, but it's not the only modality. Problem solving, solution focused, in other words, frame the learning as a problem process, online content, information literacy, flipping the classroom so you've got students engaged in dialogue about the problem rather than trying to memorize words for the next test. Teach finance and management as a core skill. Uh, how do you build a project? How do you manage a project? Institutional operation, operational sustainability, which is most of us in this room, is, needs to be part of the curriculum. It's an incredible teaching and learning opportunity. And finally, you've got to kill the silos. Uh, I know everybody's really fond of their discipline. I love my discipline. I'm an ecologist. But frankly, uh, my discipline needs to reach out and connect with many other disciplines. We all know that higher education is in deep trouble. That's no surprise to anybody here. Uh, there are several mutually reinforcing disruptive innovations and constraints, the cost, uh, the impact of multiple opportunities to take online courses. Uh, the data show that that will grow to the majority modality, um, I think, by before 2025. The students often work full time while going to college. It's astonishing how tight uh, the, the monetary situation is. Skyrocketing costs of delivery in, with bricks and mortars. And stu students often show declining literacy and competency. And this, we have to ask ourselves why. Why is this happening? Well, let me make an assertion. Making sustainability central will be the salvation, not only the future of our species, but it will transform higher education to its core relevancy. So it really is different this time. Higher education is failing. Uh, all of my career, which spans 30 years, I've heard deans and provosts and presidents come before me and say, tighten your belt, we got to cut back, the state didn't give us as much money as we thought. Uh, how many people have heard that? Yeah, okay. Well, sometimes not much changes. And in fact, up until recently, not much ever did change. I still went on with my tenured position, I still did my research, I still got my grants, had my graduate students, I taught my classes. Life was good. Uh, and I drew my salary. Well, now it's a whole different equation. Uh, large segments of the industry, if you will, are failing. The value proposition has to be clarified. This is the language that boards of trustees use. So what's the value proposition for our degree at Unity College or your degree at a different institution? What do you get out of it? Well, let me suggest something that should be really obvious. There can be no higher value proposition than meeting the imperative of sustainability. It's the most valuable thing you can do. Now, boards of trustees often don't want to hear that. They want to say, well, how much money will they make when they get out? Well, keep calm, get a job. Envir the employment will not be an issue for these students. I'm absolutely convinced of it. They will have skills that will be increasingly in demand. And if your institution is at the forefront, what will happen to your institution has already happened to Unity College. Your enrollment will surge until it's bursting at the seams. The students will come. They, coming out of high school, they know about this imperative. They're hearing the message. So, in essence, we need to create a knowledge-based economy rather than a commodity-based economy per se and a, and a manufacturing economy. Let's look at knowledge as the transactional curse, currency and how do we build that within colleges and universities. We're going from an era of resource, resource abundance, value in transactions, business stability, well-defined industries, one-way markets, limited information, and we're moving to a system of resource constraints, value and relationships, businesses highly in flux, transactions go both ways all the time, disruptive innovations are very common, industry transformation is underway, two-way markets, information abundance, everybody can get the information, you do not own it. And that's a whole new different, that's a new, new ball game for how a business can be operated. We need to be teaching it. Now, Mark Jacobson and his colleagues at uh, Stanford produced a remarkable series of papers in which they made the outrageous claim 
that we can provide all global energy with wind, water, and solar. Um, and these papers have been attacked from a variety of different corners. Um, I have yet to see an attack that fundamentally damages their quantitative analysis. Here's Mark, he says, the barriers to powering the world with wind, water, and solar by 2050 are primarily social and political, not technological or economic. So true. There's evidence that this is true from numerous quarters. This is the Rocky Mountain Institute's uh, framework for where we are today, 35% oil, 26% natural gas, 22% coal. Uh, renewables are a tiny fraction, hydro a tiny fraction. This is where we could be in 2050. Wind, solar, and other renewables could be quite high. They put an emphasis on natural gas. I think it's important for us to question that as a bridge fuel. We need to ask critical questions about the sustainability of using that as a bridge fuel. But I simply put this up to give you a notion that there are several feasible scenarios that are within our reach. What I challenge those who disagree with Mark Jacobson to do is test the hypothesis. What have you got to lose? Let's do it. Let's build this infrastructure. Let's move forward with it. And these equal jobs. So climate mitigation and adaptation in the built environment, solar photovoltaic is huge. There's a $16 trillion replacement value in all US homes. Retrofitting them for efficiency will be a booming industry. Now here, I'm actually talking primarily about the community colleges. What kind of training programs do the community colleges have in this? And many of you in this room from community colleges are thinking along these lines, and many of you have excellent training programs exactly for this. Solar hot water, geothermal, sustainable pellet heating, that needs to be looked at very carefully. There's our passive house, uh, and, and that kind of design and retrofit is a huge opportunity. Overall, efficiency retrofits are still the low-hanging fruit. They were the low-hanging fruit in the year 2000 when I got into this, and it's still the case. We've, we've nowhere near scratched the surface. We've got to adapt ag agriculture. This is the AgMIP program from the USDA and NASA. There are a couple of recent papers that are, are really um, changing the equation for agriculture. They suggest that if agriculture is done right, uh, it can mitigate industrial emissions. One paper has gone so far as to say it can mitigate all industrial emissions. That's a pretty astounding claim and it needs to be investigated. Again, let's test the hypothesis. Managing impacts on biological communities. Uh, this is the famous diagram showing you that as the century progresses, New Hampshire will ultimately have the same climate as North Carolina and Virginia. Uh, I think that would be uh, a remarkable development for the, the residents of New, New Hampshire. They might actually welcome that, but what about the forests? What about the streams? What about the phenology? Yeah. So our present day habitat suitability is here, and this is what it would look like, occupied largely by uh, generalists. So ecology in the, in the environmental century, here are just a handful of papers literally picked at random. Dispersal will limit the, the ability of mammals to track climate change in the Western Hemisphere. The future of species under climate change, resilience or decline? Climate change and moving species, furthering debate on assisted colonization. How do you decide whether to move a species threatened by climate change? The role of ecosystem services. Quantifying the influence of climate on human conflict. Economic development and the, the carbon intensity of human well-being. These are all critical questions that are, be, that are showing up in the peer-reviewed literature. What is our undergraduate population know about them? Well, here are some possible futures. I often uh, started my class with Jared Diamond's example from Easter Island. If you go on Radaprof, I'm called Dr. Doom, and so be it. Uh, I also offer them a lot of hope. Uh, is this our future, or is it this? Um, you know, when I was uh, in middle school, somebody asked me if I would ever have a flying car in my life. And I said, damn right. Where's my flying car? I'm 60. I, where's my flying car? It's not there. These are more realistic alternatives. The bottom, bottom image is modern day Mumbai. The top image is possibly something we could have. 
and we need to be working toward that. Let me end with this quote from Martin Kehoe, which has always inspired me. If you look at the science about what is happening on Earth and you aren't pe pessimistic, you don't understand the data. But if you meet the people who are working to restore this Earth from the lives of the poor and you aren't optimistic, you haven't got a pulse. Ladies and gentlemen, many of those people are in this room tonight, and I'm so proud to be among you. Thank you very much.